Hello, it's Jack Bannister here, head of sick form at Waldegrave with uh, our virtual higher education evening. This uh, video presentation is aimed at the parents or carers of our current year 12 students, and it marks the uh, launch of our university application process with this year group. Uh, it might seem strange that we're starting to talk about university um, when really the start of uh, your children's sick form journey probably doesn't seem that long ago. However, uh, the current year 13s have just gone past uh, the deadline for applying to university for their year group. And that means we are almost exactly 12 months away from the deadline to apply for university for our current year 12s. And so for us, it's a, a pertinent moment to start considering how our students can submit the best possible applications to university. And really from this point on, we're counting down towards that moment of application. So that's the reason uh, for the timing of the event. Before we get into uh, the main parts of this presentation where we'll be answering the question, how will students apply to university? I uh, do just want to acknowledge that not all students in the current year 12 uh, group will want to apply to university. And indeed, university is not the only option for students post 18. We may have some students who want to go straight into employment or others who want to pursue an apprenticeship. Now, we, we don't necessarily favour one of those paths uh, over any of the others. It's really about making sure that students are aware of all of the options uh, that are open to them, that they're given the appropriate advice to weigh up the pros and cons of those options, and that they are then able to make a decision that's very much based on their own interests, skills and aspirations. In the end, we do find that uh, the vast majority of our students do want to apply to university. Uh, typically, that's in excess of 90% of the year group who will apply to university. And that's part of the reason why we start talking about it first. Um, and we do focus a, a good amount of our attention on it. However, we will have uh, events at other points in the year to talk about apprenticeships and employment. And indeed, these things will be addressed with students through our tutorial program, um, our enrichment program on Wednesday afternoons and so on. But the focus here, as, uh, as we've already mentioned, is on university. Uh, students themselves have already had a version of this briefing in the first week of January. So they will have they've heard this information already. It's a really a very similar um, presentation that we give to them. So once you've listened to this yourselves, um, everyone who's going to be involved from the students uh, to the staff to yourself as parents and carers will be on the same page about what we need to do. So with those messages in mind, I'm going to jump straight in. And the first thing that, that I want to do here is really talk through the pros and cons of going to university. And it's important that we acknowledge there are sort of um, advantages to a university education, but also some drawbacks. And uh, I went through this information with students in my presentation to them. And it's really important we do this uh, because we have a responsibility as a school to make sure that we're providing high quality, impartial information, advice and guidance around post 18 options. And that does mean taking a balanced view um, of the benefits of going to university. So starting with the pros, when students go to university, it's really an opportunity for them to pursue a subject that they love and to work with real experts in that field. So lots of the lecturers at university will be published authors in their field uh, and depending on the university might be real uh, leaders of that field at a global level. They might be doing quite cutting edge research or be responsible for, for major advancements within their subject area. So if you're uh, passionate about a subject, being able to work with those people is a real privilege. And what we do hope is at this point, students do have at least one subject area that they're studying, not just for the sake of it or as a means to an end to get the qualification, but because they are really passionate about it. So if students do find that they just enjoy studying a particular subject, university might be a good idea for them just so that they can take uh, that passion and that enjoyment one step further. Beyond the uh, pure pleasure of studying at university level, uh, there are some more sort of tangible 
benefits to it as well. So regardless of the degree subject that students might end up studying, they will almost certainly develop a high level of transferable skills, which they then might be able to take away from that degree and the subject area it's in uh, and sort of convert those into their personal life or their future careers. Um, and those transferable skills vary from one subject to another, but they will all have some level of skill behind them. So, for example, I did uh, a history degree. And um, for me, the skills that I developed from that were advanced research skills, strong levels of written and verbal communication, an ability to read very closely um, texts and pick out very specific details, read in an, in an evaluative and analytical way. Um, and also to work through large amounts of written material very quickly. And those skills uh, ha have stood me in good stead as I've uh, moved into my own career. Um, so I think that uh, even if the subject area itself that students might study is not then one that they want to work in in the future, they can still extract some benefit from uh, that undergraduate level of study. It's also worth noting uh, that university is in fact essential for many career paths. In some cases, uh, a particular degree is an absolute necessity to go into a certain job. So for example, if someone wants to become a doctor or a vet, they're going to need very, very specific graduate level qualifications in order to do that. Um, however, there are many jobs that don't necessarily require a particular degree, but will ask for um, applicants for those positions to have a degree, often at a certain um, classification, like a 2-1 or higher. So having a, a university level of education, passing a degree will open the door to many, many jobs in a wide variety um, of fields. There is also data to suggest that graduates earn more money over the course of their careers. So, for example, the Institute for Fiscal Studies estimated that graduates earn 35 percent more than school uh, leavers, although there are a number of factors that are going to affect that figure. And of course, it is um, whilst that's an overall sort of trend looking at a large population group, there will be exceptions to that. Uh, university also gives students time to play with as well. So during the three or four years of their degree studies, they can also take that opportunity to network with the people who they meet there, uh, to build relationships with their lecturers, to un undertake part-time work alongside their studies, or to carry out things like volunteering and work experience. And all of those activities beyond the um, essential studies for their degree will help to increase their employability. So for example, it's very, very common for university students to take advantage of the holidays, to do internships or to work part time. And that experience is going to be really vital alongside their more formal qualifications for making them employable in the future. And the, the kind of final point really is that university is a chance for students to build some independence and broaden their mind uh, by living perhaps in a different area of the country and meeting people from a really diverse range of uh, backgrounds. So we're very conscious that many of our students will have been born, grown up, lived in, in the same place uh, locally to school for their whole life. Uh, and we're very aware that many students will still be quite dependent on yourselves as their parents and carers in terms of uh, sort of the house being cleaned and bills being paid and food being prepared. And so university, if students decide to move away from home, it is a great opportunity to perhaps meet people from different areas of the country who might have been brought up in a very different way and to develop some of those practical independent uh, living skills as well. So those are the advantages of going to university. But in the sake of balance, we're going to go through some of the reservations or drawbacks uh, that, that uh, exist as well. So it is it is fair to say that many university courses, whilst interesting, uh, might not equip the uh, person studying them with job specific skills. So there are some exceptions which we've already mentioned, like dentistry and veterinary science. Um, and there are certainly degree courses that are geared towards certain career paths like engineering or accountancy, but many degrees are not linked to a particular job at all. So for example, 
my degree, a history degree, that doesn't guarantee you a certain job at the end and it doesn't necessarily train you to specifically do a particular job. And the same would be true of many other degrees, you know, English literature, so on. Um, and a lot of degrees don't don't equip you with the sort of technical, practical skills you need to do a job, uh, even if they're linked to a particular industry. So, for example, you might have a degree in accountancy, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can go and start working as, as an accountant straight away. You might have to undertake additional training um, or, or sort of um, testing to meet professional standards or to achieve membership of a professional body. So many undergraduates uh, or people who've passed their undergraduate degree do find that they have to go on to do further study or workplace based training. So many students are also surprised when they go to university at how little contact time they have, uh, by which we mean teaching time where they're sort of um, at university doing something structured with a lecturer. So in a recent survey, nearly two thirds of students said they expected to have more contact hours at university than in sixth form. And in reality, that's often not the case. Uh, so someone doing a kind of arts or humanities course might have as, as few as four hours of lectures and seminars per week in their final year. And for many students, that uh, is difficult because it means they're having to do a lot of work independently, which some people might struggle with, either in terms of uh, the, the academic challenge of that or the self-motivation required. And many also feel like it doesn't represent good value for money when you're paying £9,000 a year plus in tuition fees. Um, there are differences in, in the number of contact hours from one course to another. So your arts and humanities courses where there's a large volume of reading to get through will typically have fewer hours, whereas a science based course that requires you to be in the lab using specialist equipment will, will tend to have more hours. But for many, um, they're surprised how little teaching time they get. We also know that many students worry about the financial commitment of going to university. And of course, many graduates do leave with significant debts. So some research by the Sutton Trust uh, from 2015 said that on average, university graduates leave with £44,000 worth of debt. Um, and, you know, that, that research is slightly old now, but the figures only likely to have gone up. And uh, that comes down to tuition fees. Most universities are charging just over £9,000 per academic year on tuition fees. But it's also about um, the cost of living. So many students will get a, a loan uh, to cover things like their rent and their socialising food and travel and so on. Now, um, that is a big financial commitment and students uh, might find that they are paying that money back for quite a long time after they graduate. I know that uh, my own earnings are slightly depleted every month by my uh, student debts. But I think what's really important to highlight to students there is this is not uh, a bad debt. It's not like taking out uh, a very high interest loan from a bank or getting a credit card, uh, the repayments for which might be beyond your means. This is a, an investment in your future. Uh, we've already said that going to university can increase your earnings. So it's um, something that hopefully will will end up still uh, giving you a good return on your investment. But it's also not a bad debt in the sense uh, that you only have to repay it once you have started earning. And the amount of money that you repay every month is, correlates to your earnings. So it, it's not something that's going to become an unmanageable debt that you can't pay back. Um, Again, university is also a major commitment of time. So degrees will typically last a minimum of three years, but many courses will last uh, four years. For example, a language course will often involve a year abroad, which adds an extra year to the course, or some science and engineering courses might include a year in industry, which again will extend the length of the course to four years. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is a considerable amount of time to devote to one thing, often to one subject area. And for some students, they might not want to continue their learning for that length of time, or they might not want that uh, level of delay before they enter the workplace or, or do other things that might be on their agenda. And the final sort of reservation uh, that's worth noting, or the, the final drawback, is that there's no guarantee of employment after completing a degree. So many students uh, will go into graduate level employment straight from university, but many others find that 
um, they have to spend a good few months uh, or even longer searching for a job or they find themselves initially going into employment that did not require a degree and then having to continue their search for graduate level employment for a longer period of time. And uh, still others find themselves having to go on and do further postgraduate study, which represents more time spent uh, learning and more of a financial commitment before they're actually able to secure a job. So those are really the two sides of the argument, the pros and the cons. And uh, weighing all those things up, the advice that we give to all of our students is that it is worth them at least applying to university. And you do that through making an application via a system called UCAS. And we advise students to do that even if they're unsure at this point whether they want to go to university. And the reason for this advice is that if students make an application uh, with us, it means that they're guided through the process. They're taught how to do it. And even if they then cancel their application or they, they turn down all the offers that universities make to them and decide to go down a different route, they will be equipped with the knowledge and the skills to submit a good UCAS application. And that will stand them in, in good stead in the future if they decide to make an application once they have left us. Making a university application um, during sick form also doesn't tie you into going to university. It's not, it's not like signing a contract once you've submitted your application, you're by no means obliged to go to university. You can pull out at any point. Uh, and so submitting that application does allow students to keep their options open. It means if they're, if they're not sure what they want to do, having an active application means university stays on the table. It remains as an option for them. Whereas if they don't apply, um, then, then that option is removed and it becomes more difficult for them to change their mind uh, later. Making a university application also um, is, is a manageable commitment of time. It is a little bit difficult. It does require some work, but it's it's not something that's incredibly labor intensive. It is manageable and it's also not expensive. It only costs uh, about £25 to submit a, a university application. So all things considered, we advise students to make a university application uh, so that they've got the option of changing their mind and going to university uh, even if they didn't want to initially, and so they know how to do it for the future. And there are really no downsides to submitting that university application in most cases. Where students tell us they're not intending to submit an application, uh, myself or Miss Pugh, the head of year, will typically sit down and have a conversation with them, or a careers advisor might do that, and we'll go through their logic uh, for that decision. And in many cases, we'll also uh, draw the attention of yourselves as parents or carers to that decision. Um, in most cases, we will reiterate this advice and, and suggest to students they should make a university application. The most common instances where we sort of accept the decision of students and, and agree with the decision of students not to apply to university are those instances where they're perhaps uh, looking to apply for art foundation courses which are a different type of higher education course. They're quite labor intensive um, to make applications for because you often have to apply to each ind individual institution sort of separately um, and put together a fairly extensive portfolio of practical work. And so where students are very convinced they want to do that kind of course, um, it, we will often sort of say, well, don't apply uh, for, for a conventional undergraduate course then uh, because you're probably not going to have the time to do both. But in all other cases, we will typically advise students still to apply to university, you know, if they're interested in doing apprenticeships or they want to go straight into employment, we'll usually still say, well, apply to university as well so that you've got the option of changing your mind later. So that's our advice. I would encourage you um, as parents and carers, once you've watched this video, to talk to your, um, your daughters or sons and, and kind of go through what their current thinking is and discuss that as a family. So if we sort of accept then that the majority of students are going to apply to university, the next thing to really discuss is the process for submitting that application. And what we've got here is a little bit of a flow diagram taking you through the various steps of the process. So the first thing that students really need to do before they start the physical application is to consider which course they might like to study, meaning the subjects they would like to do. And we would encourage students to start researching the courses available now 
And that's going to be a, a, a long, ongoing process over the next few months for students. There are many, many courses available across a wide range of subject areas, some that will match up to the A-levels that they've done, but others that only exist at undergraduate level and will be new to students. And uh, there's a lot of research to be done in the process of deciding which course you would like to do. It is fairly labour intensive. It feels like a really um, big, significant decision for students that they often really agonise over. So that's something uh, that it's worth start, um, starting to think about now. And similarly, students need to think about the universities they would like to apply to. So each university is different. Um, they're in different geographic or geographical locations. They are obviously different distances from home. They all have different facilities and a sort of different atmosphere or feel to them. And so students need to, again, think which ones are right for them. And they're allowed to apply to five different institutions on their UCAS application. Once students have kind of gone through that process of contemplation and, and research around the course and university choices, they can then start the physical um, application, which, as I've said already, is done through a system called UCAS. There is absolutely no need for students to be filling in any aspect of, of the application at this point. It's not something that, it, that it's um, necessary to do right now. It's uh, something that we will start working with students on in the summer term of year 12 and then we would be expecting students to start actually sending those applications off uh, in the first term of year 13. There are two deadlines to uh, really be aware of so the early entry deadline for university applications is the 15th of October uh, 2022 so the back end of this calendar year and that's for students applying for any courses at Oxford or Cambridge and uh, students applying for medicine, dentistry and veterinary science at all universities. The main UCAS deadline, which applies to everybody else, will be in January 2023. In most years, the deadline has been on the 15th of the month. This year, because of the ongoing effects of the pandemic, it was slightly delayed. Um, and so uh, it, it occurred a, a, a sort of a week after that. We don't know whether they're going to revert back to using the 15th as the deadline for next year, but it will be roughly around the middle to the back end of uh, January. There are a small number uh, of university courses that have different application systems. So I've already mentioned art foundation uh, courses. They are one year creative arts courses um, and they have a, have a very different application system. They have their own deadlines and they normally require you to apply directly to the institution, which will often mean submitting numerous applications to different places. Uh, and uh, similarly, Conservatoire has a, a separate application system as well. And uh, Conservatoire is uh, for people wanting to do courses that involve a very high level of practical musicianship. So um, the, the playing of instruments. As part of the application process, a minority of students will be asked to undertake an additional assessment. Uh, these are sometimes known as entrance exams or admissions tests. Um, this, as I said, is a minority of students. So it's mostly applicable to those who are applying for Oxford or Cambridge and uh, those applying to medicine and law at any university. We're going to talk in a little bit more detail about those assessments later in the presentation, but most of them students will be able to sit at school and uh, they typically take place in October or November um, of each year. Then a minority of students will also be invited to attend an interview. This is mostly applicable to those applying for Oxford or Cambridge. They will interview um, all of the applicants who they end up giving offers to. Uh, but there are some courses at other universities that will also interview. So typically uh, medicine courses will interview dentistry, veterinary science, and also lots of creative arts courses will interview because they want to look at students work physically and be able to discuss it with them. The timing of the interviews will vary. Most Oxford and Cambridge interviews will happen um, around sort of end of November, December time. Um, but some of the creative arts and other courses, they, they interview throughout um, kind of November, December, January, February, even into March. 
once um, students have gone through all those processes, universities will consider the evidence they've been presented with from the UCAS application, from the assessments, from the interviews, and they will make a decision on whether or not to give students an offer. So universities really have three options at their disposal when responding to, to applications. They can reject the candidate completely, um, which isn't that sort of common we find with, with our students because they're, they're typically a, applying to sensible sort of uh, in sensible choices. Um, the other option universities have is to make an unconditional offer to the student, which means they're saying to the student, you can come to this university and study this course regardless of the A-level grades you receive. That's uh, again, a fairly uncommon response from the universities. And the final type of offer they can make, and by far the most common response, is to give the student a conditional offer. And what that means is the student can go to the university if they receive certain grades specified by the universities. Now, universities are able to start making offers as soon as they begin receiving applications. And so there is often a benefit to students sending their application sometime before the final deadline, um, because earlier on in the application window, universities have got more offers to actually give out. And so we sort of think that they tend to be a little bit more forthcoming with offers if you're applying in sort of um, October, November. And then when we get into January, universities have already given out a, a reasonable proportion of their offers. And so we sort of think that in some cases they will then become a little bit more uh, picky. Now, out of the five universities that students apply to, as long as they're making sensible choices, it, it would be common for them to receive a good number of offers. Many students will get offers from all five of their universities. Um, some students, if they've put a sort of very aspirational choice in there, might get offers from, from three or four. But the vast majority of students will receive at least some offers. Um, and once they've had a response from all of their universities, students will need to look at those offers, think about how they're getting on at school and pick two of those offers to take forward. So one of the offers um, they will have to choose as their firm choice of university, which effectively means their first choice, the one they most want to go to. And then they will need to pick a second offer to take forward as their insurance choice, which is effectively a backup option in the event that they don't get into their firm choice. Students are not in a rush to respond to their university offers. Um, they they don't need to respond until they've had a response, uh, uh, sorry, an, uh, a kind of a decision from each of the five universities they've applied to. Um, and typically the deadline for students to respond to their university offers is uh, in May for this year group. That would be May 2023. Uh, once students have made their decision on their firm and insurance choices of university, the next job is to apply for student finance. Um, we find most of our students apply for student finance. All of them will be guaranteed a loan to cover the full cost of their tuition fees, which goes directly to the university. And then students can also apply um, for additional student finance to contribute towards their cost of living. And the majority of that funding is means tested, meaning um, students will receive varying amounts depending on the level of their household income. So we will brief students in more detail on applying for that finance nearer to the time. But typically student finance applications will open in February and they will have a deadline of May to guarantee receiving those funds for the start of term. After that, students really are focusing on their A-level studies, doing their best to make sure they actually achieve the results needed to meet the conditions of their university offers. Um, and ultimately, they will find out whether or not they have managed that on A-level results day, which will be in the summer holidays in 2023. So when students um, get those results, the universities will already have received them. So the, the results are passed directly to the university. Students don't have to communicate those themselves. And the, the, the results will first go to the firm choice of university. If the student has achieved the A-level grades, uh, specified in the offer from the firm choice university, then automatically they will receive their place. If students have not quite met the conditions of the offer, the firm choice university might still decide to be flexible and accept the student. 
if the grades are not where that firm choice university want them to be, then the results will be sent to the insurance choice university and the process will be repeated. So if the student's grades have met the conditions of the offer given by the insurance choice, they will get in. If not, the university can still decide to be flexible and let them in anyway. And if the results aren't up to the standard of either uh, the firm or the insurance choice university, then students will go into something called clearing, which is effectively a marketplace of all the leftover unoccupied university places. Um, and students are, often find that quite a nerve wracking experience. And there can be a bit of a negative attitude towards clearing a perception that it's going to be full of just um, not very good university places that no one else wanted. But that is a little bit of a, a misconception. You can actually get um, some really good universities putting places on clearing because they um, might have had uh, students who you know ha haven't met the conditions of uh, the offers and universities will always want to fill those places because of course each place is worth quite a lot of money in tuition fees to the university so going into clearing is a sort of stressful um, process that we will be there to support with but it by no uh, means results in you not being able to get into a good university as long as you work methodically through the clearing process you can often secure yourself a really good university place there so that's the kind of process broken down into steps i'm now going to focus in in a little bit more detail on the actual process of preparing to submit a ucas application and then filling in the application itself so to apply for university in the UK, students need to complete an application through um, an online system called UCAS. We will support students to register and set up an account with UCAS in July of this year. So there's no need for students to go away and do that um, before that point. We will help them with it. As I've already said, students will then work on their application. Uh, those for whom the early entry deadline applies will need to have, have sent off the application by the 15th of October 2022. Uh, other students will have a little bit longer. However, we tend to set a, a kind of internal deadline, a, a deadline set by us as a school to encourage students to apply earlier than that 15th of January cutoff. Uh, and that's not a deadline that we sort of rigidly enforce. It's more of a goal for students to aim for, a sort of target that encourages them to get it done at an earlier stage. And the reason we encourage um, students to get their application off earlier than that January deadline is because, as I've said, universities start making offers as soon as they begin receiving applications. And the other benefit of submitting the UCAS application earlier than the January deadline uh, is that it's sort of a job ticked off the list for students. You, UCAS can become a real distraction for students, a real preoccupation for them. It can occupy a lot of their thoughts and that can be that can become a distraction to the actual schoolwork they need to be doing. So getting that application sent off can really allow students to devote all of their headspace to their A-level studies. And it also gives them something to aim for. You know, once they've sent off that university application, they often have a clear idea in mind of where they're hoping to go and what they're hoping to study. And that also gives them an indication of the grades they need to aim for. And it can give them a, a sort of a real boost in terms of their motivation. I, as I've already said, there are a small number of other courses, including Art Foundation and Conservatoire, that have different deadlines. And we've encouraged students already to let either myself or Miss Pugh, their head of year, know if uh, that applies to them. And I would also encourage any students wanting to do an art foundation to let Miss Jameson, the head of art, know, and any students thinking of applying to conservatoire to let Miss O'Brien, our head of performing arts, know, because they're really the subject specialists who will be best placed to advise students on what those courses are like and help them put their applications together. In the box to the right of this slide, I've given you a breakdown of the different sections that can be found on the UCAS application. So when students are physically filling it in, they will need to give a certain amount of personal information like their name and date of birth. They will need to enter their course and university choices. And as I've said, there are five of those. They will need to write a personal statement, which is more of an extended piece of writing, um, kind of almost advertising themselves as a student, trying to convince the admissions tutors that they're a viable candidate for the course. There's a teacher reference, which we write as an endorsement for the students. They will need to fill in their education and qualifications. So their GCSEs, the A-levels they're studying and so on. And then again, we as teachers will uh, give them predicted grades of what we think is a likely outcome at the end of their A-levels. So working through 
some of those sections in uh, a little bit more detail. One of the trickiest parts to fill in for students is the course in university choices, not because it's uh, physically difficult to enter that information onto the UCAS application, but because it's a really big decision uh, that often requires a significant amount of thought and research before students actually arrive at a final conclusion. And it's understandable that students find it challenging to decide because there are 37,000 university courses at 130 institutions in the UK. So there's a vast array of options that students need to work through. They can put five choices on their UCAS application and it's advisable that they pick either the same or very similar courses at all five of their choices rather than five totally different courses. And that's important because they can only put one personal statement in the application and it's very difficult to write a single personal statement that would work for a, a really disparate array of courses. Uh, it's also advisable for students to apply to universities and courses with an, a range of entry requirements um, out of those five choices. So every university course has published entry requirements, which are an indication of the grades that they would normally be looking for students to receive. So that's advertised um, on university websites, on their course pages, and it will typically be expressed as um, a three grade uh, kind of benchmark. So, for example, if you wanted to, let's say, go and do a chemistry degree at the University of Exeter, they might say they want three A's at A level for you to be able to get in. So we would advise students to have a spread of entry requirements across their five choices, ranging from some aspirational choices um, that, that uh, require sort of fairly high grades down to uh, some much safer choices that work as a kind of backup option in case something goes wrong over the next few months. There are a few limitations on university choices. So students are only allowed to apply, apply to either Oxford or Cambridge. You're not allowed to apply to both. And students applying for medicine can only put four medicine choices on the application. And the fifth choice has to be for something different. So typically students will pick something closely related to medicine, like biomedical science. And the reason for that last stipulation is that uh, medicine is a very competitive course. It's extremely difficult to get into. And so... Um, that fifth choice being something different sort of inherently makes it a, a safer choice, a backup option that prevents them sort of getting no offers at all. So one of the things that I mentioned there is that students should vary the entry requirements of their university choices. So our advice is that the five choices should be divided up as, as you can see in that box to the right of the slide. So we would advise students to have one aspirational choice so this would be the one that has the highest entry requirements. And uh, we would say that at this point, the best guide for students in terms of deciding what's aspirational, what's secure, what's safe, is to look at their target grades. So their target grades are the ones that were have been communicated a couple of times now on the progress grade sheets that have been sent home. The target grades are based on an average point score from students' GCSE results, um, and then that information being compared to other students nationally over a long period of time who had similar um, a similar set of GCSE results. So the target grades essentially represent students and students making an average amount of progress over the course of their A-level studies compared to other students nationally with the same GCSE results as them. So the target grades are, are quite a strong statistical indicator of what students are likely to get at the end of uh, their A-level studies. It's also worth looking at the predicted grades that staff have already been putting on the progress grade sheets uh, that were sent home. So one of those went home actually very recently, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and whereas the target grade is a kind of consistent benchmark that students are looking to aim for by the end of their A-level studies, the predicted grades are much more of an indication of the, the path that students are currently on in the opinion of their subject teachers. Um, so it's worth looking at both of those, those bits of data um, and kind of students basing uh, their understanding of what's an aspirational choice, what's secure, what's safe on that information, um, particularly the target grades. So if a student had target grades, let's say of 
three A's at A level. An aspirational choice might be a university course that's asking for uh, one A star and two A's. So the entry requirements are just very slightly above the uh, target grades that students have been given. All right. And we do encourage students to be aspirational um, and to put a choice on their UCAS application that's going to stretch them, challenge them, that's optimistic um, and that gives them a kind of a real best case scenario in case they make really accelerated progress over the next few months. We would then encourage students to put two secure choices on their UCAS application. So these would be courses where the entry requirements are in line with their target grades. So again, to carry on my, my hypothetical example, if a student had target grades of three A's at A-level, their secure choices should be courses that are also asking for three A's. And these are ones that students then are, are quite likely to get offers from and that they are quite likely to be able to meet the conditions of those offers. We would then encourage students to have two safe choices. So these are courses with entry requirements to varying degrees below their target grades. So again, with my example, if a student had target grades of three A's at A-level, they might have one safe choice that's asking for AAB and another safe choice that's asking for ABB. And what this means is it, it almost guarantees that students will receive offers from those universities. Um, uh, and that's a, a big confidence boost. And it avoids that kind of worst case scenario of them not getting any offers at all. And it also means um, that they're likely to get offers from those universities which are asking for grades that are very manageable, very achievable for students. And so that can also help to take some of the pressure off our young people. Um, and it also means they've got offers in the bank that allow for something to go a little bit wrong. Now, what we find is um, that students are often very comfortable looking for the aspirational choices. They're happy looking for the secure choices. But we often encounter a real reluctance among students to pick any safe choices. And the kinds of things that we will typically hear from students are, you know, I'm very confident I'm going to at least meet my target grades. I don't need a safe choice. Or they will say, I don't like any of the universities. Um that have lower entry requirements, I'd rather not go to university at all than go to one of those ones. And that's an understandable point of view, um, but you never know what's going to happen. You know, we've had students in the past who have been doing really well, and then for reasons totally beyond their control, uh, their grades have, have declined, maybe because they've spent a long period of time off school ill, um, or, or something um, challenging has happened in their personal life. And having those safe choices um, means that even if something like that does go wrong, students still have a route to university because they've got some universities that will have given them quite achievable offers uh, in terms of the grades they're asking for. What we also find is that while students at this stage might say, I don't want to go to that type of university or I don't want to go to one of those safe universities, in our experience, they often will change their mind um, on A-level results day uh, and they will decide actually I am happy to go to one of those safer choices because they're seeing all their friends going off to university, they don't want to be left out, they don't want to have to reset A-level exams and things like that. So it is worth having those safer choices there uh, as a backup option and if students follow this kind of format that we're giving them what they should end up with is a good number of offers from their five uh, universities sort of a, a good four or five universities making them offers and the offers that do come in will be at all kinds of varying levels um, in terms of the grades they're asking for and that means when students get to May of 2023 and they're having to pick their firm and their insurance choice they've got lots of different options uh, in terms of what they can put down and they can make a decision that really makes sense in terms of the level they're working at at that stage. When students are making their um, course and university choices these are some of the questions they might want to consider and indeed you might want to discuss these as a family. So these questions relate much more to the institution, the actual university itself. So students might want to think about how far away from home they want to be, how much it costs to rent property in the area, which is something most students do in their second and third year. What is there to do? What's the cost of living? Uh, what are the facilities at the university like? And so on. And some of these questions, 
you know, will not matter to some students. There might be students who aren't really interested in sports. They're not that keen to, to join any societies or do any extracurricular activities. So that's not going to be a big consideration for them. But there are other questions here which might be very important to some students. So, um, you know, in terms of how far away from home they want to be, we have students every year who are keen to stay at home because they're really reliant on their family as a support system or because they don't want to, um, from their perspective, be wasting money on rent. They'd rather just stay at home. Um, then we've got other students who, you know, are very keen to move much further away from home and have that real sense of independence and time away from their family, um, managing things for themselves. So this, these are kinds of questions that we're encouraging students already to start mulling over in their head, talking to each other about and talking to their families about. So this is the kind of thing that you could discuss yourselves at home. In terms of the actual university courses, we have another set of questions. So students might think about how the course is assessed, how much they, they enjoy the subject, if it's something they're doing already. They might think about whether that course offers um, a year abroad or an industry placement, if that's something they're interested in. They might think about the graduate employment prospects. So most universities do publish um, data on their websites about the percentage of their graduates who are in graduate level employment within you know, a year of leaving university. So th these are things that students might want to think about. Again, every year we have students who really need to think carefully about how a course is assessed. There are some students who really excel in exams. They work well under that pressure and in that format. But we also have students who hate exams, who find it really difficult to revise, to work from memory, to operate in timed conditions, who don't cope well with that pressure. And so for those students, they might want to pick a course that is assessed much more through coursework, through kind of longer, more regular assignments that take place throughout the academic year. And it is even sort of fair and accurate to say that the same subject might be run quite differently from one university to another. So, for example, you might decide you want to do or a student might decide they want to do a chemical engineering degree. And at one university, that might involve a year working in industry and another university. It might not. It might just be a three year course that's entirely based in the university. And so students really need to think about what subjects they want to study in general and then how that subject varies from one university to another and again these are questions they can be discussing but they're also questions that students need to not just talk about but research by going online by looking at the university websites by going to open days and taster events and so on at uh, the next uh, section of the ucas application to talk about is the personal statement so this is effectively a short reflective essay that students write with the intention of persuading the universities that they're suitable candidates for the courses they've applied to. It's often the aspect of the application that takes the most work. Students will spend many hours sort of drafting and redrafting the personal statement, and it can be uh, really labour intensive and anxiety inducing. The personal statement is limited in length to 4,000 characters, which and the characters are all letters, spaces between words, line breaks, punctuation, anything, every button they press on the keyboard represents a character in the personal statement. Um, if you're typing on a sort of Word document in a normal size of font, like size 12, 4,000 characters will normally be just over a page of typing. Uh, officially, there's also a line limit of 47 lines, but that's not a very useful guide because that's 47 lines in the box you have to ultimately put the personal statement into on the UCAS website. And that does not necessarily correlate uh, to the number of lines on a kind of Google Doc. We support students heavily in writing their personal statements. So we'll do a briefing for students in June. Um, sorry, that should say 2022. Um, my, my time machine isn't quite ready yet. Uh, so we'll do a briefing for students in June 2022, going through the structure of a personal statement, showing them some examples of previous personal statements that students have done. Form tutors will provide feedback on the first draft at least, and uh, subject teachers are always very happy to look at personal statements and give feedback as well. So students aren't expected to be writing their personal statement now. It's something that we will go through with them uh, later. This is kind of an example of, of the type of structure students might use. So they'll typically do a short introduction. 
They will then focus a big chunk of it on their academic studies, so things they're doing in terms of their A-levels. They will then focus another big chunk on what we call supercurricular activities. So these are things students are doing outside of their A-level studies, but which are still directly related to the course they want to apply for at university. So, for example, if you were applying for a fine art degree, going to exhibitions at an art gallery would be a supercurricular activity. If you're applying for a fine art degree and you were, uh, wrote about playing football, that would not be a supercurricular activity because it's not directly relevant to the course you're applying for. Students um, then have the option of writing a kind of a much smaller section on their extracurricular activities. And these are things that they're doing outside of their studies that really don't bear a direct relation to the course they're doing. So, for example, if you're applying for a geography degree and you um, could play grade eight piano, that would be an extracurricular activity because playing piano doesn't make you good at geography. But it's still sort of interesting information from which you might have um, developed some useful skills. Students would then do a, a short conclusion as well. Now, one of the sort of um, surprises that people often have when they look at the distribution of the characters there across those different sections is that most of it is has an academic focus. So it's either talking directly about what students are doing in their A-levels or it's talking about what they've done in their subject area to extend their experience beyond the A-level curriculum. Very little of the personal statement should be devoted to things that aren't directly relevant to the course they want to do or that are not actually academic. So this isn't meant to, although it's called a personal statement, it, it's not so much help helping the admission tutor to really understand their personality overall. It's helping the admissions tutor to understand students in terms of their academic personality. So it's conveying their passion for skills in an aptitude for the subject that they're applying for at university. Uh, another bit of the application, which in fact we do as staff, is the teacher reference. So again, this is an extended piece of writing, very similar to the personal statement in the sense that it's limited to 4,000 characters. Um, and we will write the teacher reference um, at the very end of year 12, and we'll be commenting on the attitude, motivation, skills, academic performance and wider experiences of students to support their application. Uh, the reference is written by a number of different staff and then edited together by the form tutor. So typically we will have an introduction giving context on the school, which I will write and will be the same for everyone. We then might do a paragraph of individual context for some students, and that helps universities to give contextual offers. So if we've got students with um, special education needs or who've experienced particularly significant physical or mental health issues or have gone through a kind of personal um, trauma, such as a bereavement, that might be something that we work uh, with the student or, or yourselves as, as a family to draw the university's attention to. The bulk of the reference is then made up by what we call subject references. So there will be a paragraph written by a subject teacher for each of the A-levels uh, that your daughter or son is doing. And then at the end, there will be an endorsement from the tutor, which might comment on some of the things students have done uh, outside of uh, their, their A-level classes, some of the extra things they've done. So... This will, this will involve contributions from a, a range of subject teachers and then the whole thing's edited together into one cohesive piece of writing by the form tutor. Students are allowed to read their reference before it's sent. Um, and uh, although it's, it's not something we have to collaborate with students on, it is our prerogative to write the reference as we see fit. Uh, as, long as, as long as the students are sort of being reasonable, we are happy to make little adaptations. So, for example, if a student has done something that they think is really impressive, but that they didn't have space for in their personal statement, um, we might try and include that in the teacher reference if they bring it to our attention. Now, we're not in the business of, of giving students bad references. We want to give them all good references. We want them all to get lots of, of great offers from their universities. It, it's in our interest as well as theirs for them to submit a strong university application. But we do also have to be honest. And so what I've said very plainly to students is that if they want the best possible teacher reference, they need to be behaving in a way on a day to day basis that allows us to honestly um, give them that reference that they're looking for. So students who arrive on time every day, uh, who are well behaved, who are polite and respectful to their peers and to staff, 
uh, who make the effort to form good relationships with people in, in our school community, who arrive on time to their lessons, who, who bring the proper equipment, who meet their homework deadlines, who go above and beyond by attending some of the extra talks and so on that we organise, who contribute something back to our school community, perhaps through volunteering, through mentoring younger students, things like that. They're going to get really good references because they've behaved in a way which has given us lots of fantastic material to include. Students who are regularly late to school, um, who are accumulating lots of penalty points as a sanction for behaviour that falls below the expected standards, who are frequently missing deadlines, who are doing the bare minimum. Whilst we're not going to then give them a very critical reference, it, it limits our ability to be complementary. And so we're really encouraging students to uh, be accountable for their actions and to make a real commitment to doing all of the right things and being the best possible versions of themselves between now and the end of their uh, sixth form experience so that we can reflect that in the teacher reference. Another part that students have to fill in is the education qualifications section. So students do need to list all of their GCSE grades on the UCAS application. Sometimes students have a GCSE grade they're not very proud of, uh, that they think isn't as high maybe as they want it to be, and they ask if they can not include that. That is not allowed. Um, students have to disclose all of their qualifications and we will check that they have done so. University courses generally don't specify minimum grade requirements at GCSE, but they, they will look at the GCSE grades because they are a good way of validating the accuracy of the predicted grades that we've given. So if students have got quite low GCSE grades and we've sort of given predicted grades of you know A's or A stars that's going to look implausible to the university unless there's a, a particular context for that that we've explained in the reference so um, that means we have to be sensible in our predicted grades which is something I'll talk about in more detail in a moment but it, it, it's also a way that the GCSE grades get used um, students also have to enter their A-level subjects onto the UCAS application with the grades um, set as pending, which allows us to enter the predicted grades. One of the sort of common mistakes that students make every year uh, and that myself and Ms. Pugh will undoubtedly be constantly correcting is that students forget to put their A-levels on their UCAS application, which um, is a major error um, that, that we would spot, but we would really like students to sort of get right for themselves. Um, if students have taken an AS, an AS qualification, they have to put that on there as well. But that won't apply to many because we don't um, sit AS exams at Waldegrave as standard. Uh, internal assessments and, and examinations don't need to go on there. So mock grades don't have to be entered. And students also have the option of putting in any other qualifications um, that are formal as well. So Duke of Edinburgh can go on there. Music grades can go on there and so on coaching qualifications there's many other accredited courses that can go on there uh, and that will enhance the application especially if they're directly relevant to the course a student's applying for so for example if a student's applying for a degree in sport and exercise science or sports coaching and they're um, they've done their you know level four fa football coaching badge that's a very relevant thing to put on there uh, one of the more contentious um Aspects of the UCAS application is always the predicted grades, which we enter. So these are uh, meant to be a likely outcome uh, of, or a, li a prediction of a likely outcome that students are going to achieve at the end of th year 13 in terms of their A-level grades. So these go on the UCAS application and what the university will typically do is compare the predicted grades to their published entry requirements. Um, and they're more likely to make an offer if the predicted grades are either in line with or exceed the published entry requirements. Um, these predicted grades need, from our perspective, to be based on hard data. And they have to be based on hard data to ensure that we are being consistent from one student to another um, and that there's there's uh, less risk of kind of bias or personal relationships influencing those predicted grades. So what we will typically do is take the target grades students have been issued with, which as I've already explained are based on an average of their GCSE results and represent them making an average amount of progress over the course of their sixth form experience compared to students nationally with the same GCSE profile as them. We will also look at the results for the exams they sit at the end of year 12, their mock exams, 
Um, and we will tend with the predicted grades, or in fact, we will uh, with the predicted grades, give students whatever is higher out of those pieces of data. So if the target grade is higher, then that's what they get for their UCAS prediction. If the year 12 exam results are higher, that's what they will be given. Um, or it might be a, a blend of the two. So for example, in one subject, their target grade might be higher than their exam result. In another subject, it might be the exam result that's higher and so on. Now, the reason um, that we use that system is, as I've said, it's rooted in hard data. So it's not so much a personal perception of the teacher. It's, it's something very tangible. Uh, the ALPS target is a really strong statistical indicator of a likely outcome at A-level, but it's based on a vast national data set. Um, and the exam result is a good piece of data to include because it very much gives students a level of agency over their UCAS predicted grades. If they want certain grades predicted to them for UCAS and those grades are higher than their target grades, you know, they've got the opportunity to prove that they're capable of working at that level in their year 12 exams. Um, if students are issued with predicted grades that they're not happy with, then we are willing to look at those and review them, but we will only make a change if there is compelling data uh, to back it up. So we won't make changes to UCAS predicted grades um, based on emotional pleas, or sort of promises of harder work in the future or um, an, an argument that they've got a tutor now, so they're going to do better. Um, we, we will always base it on, on data. So if students are unhappy with the predicted grades that they're issued with um, kind of at the end of year 12, based on the exam results and the target grades, some students will choose to delay sending their UCAS application until they've done their first set of year 13 mocks, which are typically in December. Um, and it, so that they've got the opportunity to get higher grades in that set of mocks and, and that then acts as data that allows us to justify raising those predicted grades. What we can promise is that no student will be given a predicted grade lower than either their target grades or the results they achieve in their mock exams at the uh, end of year 12. All right. Um, when students are sort of talking to, to um, staff, which will usually be myself or their head of year, Miss Pugh, about their predicted grades. And it's really important that they follow the process that we will set out to them at that time in terms of addressing those and that the tone of conversations is mature, calm uh, and respectful. We normally have quite a set process for students appealing predicted grades. So there will typically be a kind of Google form for them to fill out and we will then use the information they've put on that form to review the case. What we, uh, as I said, will not respond to is kind of students saying things like, you know, please believe in me or you're sort of ruining my my dreams um, by not giving me the predicted grades I want, because we, we just can't have our decisions be driven uh, by, by emotion in that way. It has to be logical, rational and rooted in data. Um, so we would really kindly ask that you support that message, stick to the kind of lines of communication that, that we set out in terms of, of querying grades and maintaining that mature, calm and respectful tone and encouraging uh, your daughters and sons to do the same. The best thing that students can do is work as hard as they can at their A-level studies now so they've got the best possible chance of achieving really high grades in their mock exams at the end of year 12 and that will then uh, result in them getting UCAS predicted grades that they're happy with. One of the common questions that we get asked all the time is, is when will the predicted grades be given? And uh, we will aim to do that just before the summer holidays. So at the end of year 12, uh, or if, if for some reason that's not uh, possible, we've had, you know, as you will know, quite a lot of disruption in education over the last couple of years as a result of the pandemic, then it'll be very, very early in year 13. Sometimes people say, well, that makes it difficult to decide which courses students want to apply for. Uh, you know, they want their predicted grades early so that they can compare them to the published entry requirements for courses. But uh, realistically, we can't give those UCAS predicted grades at this point because students are not far enough through the course for us to be making um, those really accurate predictions. And typically students find things academically more difficult at the beginning of their A-level studies and then get better over time. And so the data for most students at this point would not be looking as favourable as it, as it ultimately will do in the end. So 
we won't be issuing predicted grades until uh, the end of year 12 at the earliest or the, or the very beginning of year 13. And in the meantime, students should uh, use their target grades to inform their research about the kind of places they might like to apply for. I mentioned uh, briefly at the start that some students will need to do entry exams. This is a minority of students. Uh, most will not have to do this. It's normally for students applying for various courses at Oxford or Cambridge or those applying for medicine and law at any other university. I've put a big list on the box on the right there of the most common entry exams that students need to sit. Um, it is the responsibility of students to notify the school if they need to sit an entry exam and want to sit it with us. We are a registered test centre for the vast majority of entry exams, with the exception of the LNAT, which is a law admissions test. Um, and so students can sit the, the admissions test with us, but they must let us know. We have no means of knowing whether or not a student needs to do an entry exam. They need to work that out for themselves. And the way they can do that is by looking at the entry criteria on the university websites for the places they're applying to. And also if students enter a particular course choice onto their UCAS application, uh, a little red notification will normally pop up on the screen if an entry exam is required. So we will um, survey students and write home to parents and carers um, at the start of year 13, asking if they want to be registered for an entry exam and setting out how you can go about informing us. Um, and uh, if you then respond to that or students respond and give us the required information, we will register them to sit it with us. Some students might decide they don't want to sit it with us. They want to do it somewhere else. Or as I've said, there are a small number of entry exams like the LNAT that we're not able to run. And in those cases, students can look for a registered test centre nearby. Um, so typically most places that run driving theory tests also offer entry exams. Um, so. There's one in Kingston, for example, where students can do the LNAT. In terms of supporting students to get ready for the entry exams, because there are so many of them and they are very specialised, we can't run a sort of a generic programme to get students ready for entry exams. They are very, very subject specific and they are quite demanding within that subject area. They're often testing skills above and beyond conventional A-levels. Um, so we don't run a formal programme of preparing students for entry exams. However, students are very welcome to ask their subject teachers for help. And in many cases, um, subject teachers will be happy to either look over practice papers uh, or to um, give students sort of feedback or go over particularly challenging questions with them. So, for example, I'm a history teacher. Every year I will typically work with the small number of students who are sitting the history aptitude test and I might spend uh, a few weeks meeting with them on a regular basis to go through practice papers or look over the kinds of uh, historical sources they might be asked to analyse in that test. And many of my colleagues in other departments would do the same thing as well. There are generally practice papers published online, so students can practice and there are often mark schemes published online as well. And there's also lots of um, videos published by universities on YouTube that do kind of walk through examples of those entry exams as well. So that's particularly true of the entry exams that apply for Oxford and Cambridge. So, for example, on the Jesus College YouTube channel, there are um, exemplars of many of the entry exams, such as the TSA. Um, which stands for Thinking Skills Assessment. And um, those are useful things for students to look at as they seek to prepare themselves as well. But this is something that most students don't need to worry about because they won't have to do one. Again, applying to a minority of students are the interviews. So some students will be invited to interview. Mostly that will be Oxbridge candidates, those applying for medicine and some creative arts courses. I've already mentioned um, that interviews for Oxbridge will typically take place in, in November or December, um, whilst other institutions will hold them at various times throughout the year. We are committed to trying to give every student at least one practice interview, but in order for us to do that, we need students to let us know if they're likely to need one. So we can sort of organise the practice interviews very easily for our Oxford and Cambridge applicants and for our medicine applicants because we will normally know who they are quite far in advance because we're working more closely with them to put together their applications. But there are a number of other courses um, that interview as well. So, for example, we have someone in Year 13 currently who's been invited to interview uh, for marine biology. 
that's not something we would necessarily have predicted happening. And so we've been reliant on the student telling us to then be able to organize them a practice interview. So we would really ask that students inform us if they need an interview, uh, a practice interview at the earliest possible stage so that we've got time to recruit a quality uh, person to conduct that interview for them uh, and to actually get it organized. If students say to us they need a practice interview and they only give us 48 hours notice, we'll still try to do something, but it's going to be of lesser quality because we won't have had the time we needed to really um, work out how to do it in the best possible way. So that sort of runs through most aspects of the application process. Uh, what I'm going to do now is outline the support that the school will provide. We have an extensive program of support. Um, comprising lots of activities, events, and there's many people in, in school who will happily sit and have conversations with individual students to, to help them assess their options and put together their applications. Um, but at the same time, these applications do belong to the students and there is a certain onus on them as well. So what I'm doing here is setting out the school support um, and afterwards I will go through what the students need to be doing at this point and, and then we're all clear what our roles are. So we've already hosted an event in November of last year uh, called the University and Careers Insight Day that, uh, where students were off timetable for the day and they were all able to attend a, a taster lecture um, which were conducted across a range of subject areas by some uh, staff from Royal Holloway and St Mary's who very kindly volunteered to come onto the school site. So that will have given them a little insight into what university lectures are like. We then have our higher education um, briefing. So we've already briefed students on this uh, in the first week of January. Now we're briefing ourselves as parents and carers. And um, this term as well, students will have a focus on Wednesday tutor times on the university application process. So we'll be going into much more detail on course and university choice um, and on super and extracurricular activities and so on. We are intending to run a trip to the UCAS exhibition in March of this year, which we'll be writing to you about soon. So that's very much like a fair where lots of different universities will have stalls uh, where they, there will be current students and sort of admissions tutors from the universities talking about the courses they offer uh, and what students can do to help uh, themselves submit a really strong application to them. We then sort of take a little bit of a pause in terms of the program of events we are running as we get closer to the end of year 12 mocks. And then once those mocks are over and students have returned to school, um, we we really have a heavy focus on preparing for applying to university in the summer term of year 12. So we'll run our UCAS registration briefing where we get everyone signed up to uh, UCAS. We'll run our personal statement briefing and get students working on their first drafts. So we will ask all students to have a first draft in a couple of weeks before the end of the academic year so that form tutors can give feedback before the summer holidays start, which allows students to work on implementing that feedback over the holidays and submit a second draft as soon as they arrive back in year 13. We typically will try and run um, some university trips as well. So in the past, we've tended to do those uh, in the summer term as well in, in sort of July. And we are looking into doing that again. Uh, one of the effects we found from the pandemic is that a lot of universities have been reluctant to, to accept big groups of students onto campus. Um, so we'll, we'll have to wait and see what the situation is in the summer and what the universities are saying to us in, in terms of that being viable. Uh, however, we are always willing to sign students off um, from school for a day or two here and there across the academic year if they want to go to university open days um, that are running in term time. So that's something that, that you as parents and carers can let us know is happening um, and we will then allow them to go. So. Um, Students can sort of run their own university trips, either, either you can go as a family or they can go with friends at other times as well if, if we're not able to organise a sort of larger trip. As I've said, we're a test centre for most entry exams, so that makes it easy for students to sit them here. We will provide really high quality uh, teacher references. We have a specialist Oxbridge programme and in the letter that was sent home preceding this event, um, uh, it, it mentioned that we are running an in-person Oxbridge evening that we're inviting both students and their parents uh, or carers to uh, in the coming weeks. And, and in that event, I will talk in more detail about what the Oxbridge programme entails. 
I've also mentioned that we will offer practice interviews for those that are invited. We will do a student finance briefing in February 2023. And we also have trained careers advisors available on site for individual meetings with students if needed. And students are also really welcome to talk to their form tutors, their subject teachers, Miss Pugh, their head of year, or myself as the head of sick form. Uh, and we will be able to advise them um, on their options and talk things through with them as well. So that's the role that school play. The next steps for students at this point are as follows. Uh, so what we don't need students to be doing at this point is stressing out because they've got lots and lots of time to make up their mind. We just want them to start gradually kind of working on the process of getting ready to apply for university. So we're getting them to start at this point, not because there's lots of urgent jobs that need doing, but because we want them to work gradually and methodically on this over an extended period of time so they don't end up in a rushed panic later. Um, we also don't need students to kind of go away and set up a UCAS application or start filling anything in or drafting personal statements at this stage. That would really be premature. It's too soon for that. But there are a few things students can be doing to get ready for applying to university. So the first thing they can be doing is researching their course and university choices. That process can begin now. We've given them some questions to consider that we went through earlier in the presentation. So those are things that they can be um, using the kind of the internet, university websites to research. They can be discussing with their peers uh, and their families. There's course guides published on the UCAS website. Uh, there's a really good search engine for university courses called What Uni. That's a it's a little bit like um, Google for university courses. So they can enter different search parameters there, uh, and then it will bring up a list of results that um, kind of names the university, the course, and, and lists the entry requirements. And you can sort of click on the links for for further details. And we'd really encourage students um, to look for university open days, for taster days that are running, and to actually attend some of those events. So that's the first thing they can be doing. They don't need to arrive at a really definitive conclusion about the five places they're going to apply for at this stage, but they need to begin that process uh, of thinking about it so that they can make a really well-informed decision later. We would also encourage students to prepare for writing their personal statement. So they don't need to actually write it, but when they do come to write it, they need to have already done things that are worth writing about. So a big chunk of the personal statement is based around what we call supercurricular activities. And I've already explained that they are things um, that go beyond the conventional A-level curriculum, but which are directly related to the course they want to apply for. So very often that will take the form of wider reading, um, listening to relevant podcasts, going to subject specific taster days, watching taster lectures online or attending them in person. Sometimes it can be work experience. Um, so there's many different things students can do there. I've already given students access on their Year 12 Careers and Progression Google Classroom to a number of lists of potential supercurricular activities with lots of book recommendations for different subject areas. So I would really encourage students to start doing some uh, wider reading uh, around the subjects that they think they might apply for at university and sort of building up that bank of experiences really studying a levels and, and getting certain grades in them is the absolute bare minimum students need to do to apply for university and if they want to be applying to the more prestigious or competitive institutions they need to do something extra to differentiate themselves from the other applicants and that really comes down to what have they done outside of their studies that's still relevant to that course they're applying for you know what wider reading have they done what work experience have they done and so on so wider reading is a really, really good one uh, for students to be doing. And the final thing that often gets overlooked um, by students in this process is that the whole thing hinges on the A-level grades they end up receiving. So the universities will all be asking for, for certain grades. The offers they give are likely to be conditional um, to the students achieving certain grades. And so ultimately, students are going to have to deliver in the summer at the end of year 13, the grades that their chosen universities are asking for. And that means they need to maximize their academic pro progress. Uh, and that needs to start now. So students need to be making sure they're in lessons, that they're minimizing the time they have off school um, for avoidable reasons, that they are making sure that they're getting into all their classes and they're not sort of falling victim to the temptation to, to truant the odd lesson here and there, that they're arriving on time, that they're really focused in class, that they're communicating clearly with their teachers, that they're getting actively involved in the lessons, um, that they're asking questions as and when they need to, that they're getting all their homework done, that they're doing lots and lots of independent work beyond 
the homework they've been specifically set outside of the classroom. So we encourage four to five hours of independent learning per subject per week for students. Um, that includes homework, but it also, when homework hasn't been set, means they need to identify tasks to do from them for themselves. And that will often be you know, getting ahead with writing revision notes, doing practice exam questions. The students who work the hardest and work most closely with their teachers tend to end up making the most progress and getting the best results, which, which won't come as a surprise. Um, so listening hard work, taking on board feedback. Those are the key things that students really need to be doing at this point. These next steps are all things that you can support with uh, as families. So please do talk to your daughters and sons about their course in university choices. Encourage them to look up when open days are happening. Help them with booking their transport to and from that or even go with them. Really discuss um, those questions I showed you earlier in the slides. Uh, and push them to sit down and do their kind of research online on the courses they might like to study. Um, you can also help them with uh, building up their, their supercurricular activities. So make sure you're encouraging them to look at the lists of supercurricular activities I've put on the careers and progression classroom, uh, order the books for them if possible, talk to them about the things they're doing, the reading they're doing, ask them to explain what they're reading to you, have a discussion about it as a family. And you can also be helping them to maximise their academic progress by sort of, um, you know, tipping them out of bed in the morning if they're reluctant, getting them out of the door at a good time, getting them into school, uh, making sure they've got a good working area at home, that they're staying organised and sort of really um, sort of maintaining a hard line at home on making sure that they're putting in the work outside of class. So I know that can be challenging when students are, are getting to this age and it can be a little bit un uncooperative sometimes and not want to do what their parents are telling them. Uh, but it's important to sort of remember that you're in charge, it's your house, it's your rules. And these students, if they're not sort of self-motivated to put in the right number of hours of work, what they need is ourselves as teachers and yourselves as parents and carers sort of presenting a united front, giving them that consistent message. They need to get the work done outside of class, put in the hours and sort of really making them do that. So that's what we can be working on at the moment. There's a few key dates here for you, all of which I've already mentioned uh, in this presentation, but that's sort of a, a one slide record of them all. Um, and then the final thing is really around questions. So if we were doing this event in person, the, the opportunity would be there to sort of come and ask me those questions in the room. Clearly that chance uh, isn't there with this virtual event. Uh, but you're very welcome to email in to sickform at waldgravesch.org or to call the school uh, and, and either myself, Miss Pugh, the head of year or a careers advisor would be very happy to either talk to you on the phone, answer your questions in writing or arrange a meeting face to face. So that's all from me uh, in this presentation. And we look forward to working with you over the coming weeks and months to support your daughters and sons in assessing their options, working out what they want to do, and then helping them submit the strongest possible application uh, as they move through their uh, A-level studies and look forward to a very exciting future post-18. Thank you very much and goodbye.